with an epidemiologist, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Ray Watt Dionanden, who is an epidemiologist and associate professor at the University of Ottawa. Welcome, doctor. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, we're seeing some disturbing numbers, and I'll begin with the movement of the virus today and get your reaction. Uh, you know, the second wave, how deeply are we in it? And now we learn that in Ontario, the chief medical officer of health says they're going to have to have more actions in the next few days. And Ontario could expect a thousand cases a day during this month. What is that based on? Do you know? Well, it's based on modeling that I think is going to be presented later this morning. And that modeling, of course, is based upon what we've seen in the past, what we've seen in other countries, and the dynamics of the transmission as we currently know it. The infection rate, the transmission rate, the hospitalization usage rate, things like that. So what we see in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia particularly, their second wave was extraordinarily large, bigger than their first resulting in a lot more deaths than the first. And they got under control with some fairly draconian actions. Right now in Madrid, we see their second wave is pretty bad. Um, Their ICUs are full. uh, They're canceling elective surgeries. And they're deep in it as well. So using those scenarios as cautionary tales, I think that's how the planning is being unrolled. It is becoming political, though, and, you know, we often talk to virologists and epidemiologists from the United States. They're experiencing a different level of it. How is it for you as an epidemiologist to see the political rollout? It's both um, hilarious and upsetting. Uh, When we started planning for this pandemic or responding to this pandemic, no one ever expected that the politics would be a great confounder in how we responded or indeed the misinformation and the fact that misinformation is accelerated by political agendas, right? So a good third of my day is spent arguing with people or responding to misinformation that comes out of particular political camps. So it seems that there seem to be camps that actively want to promote the pandemic. And I don't know why that is. Is it a a deliberate ignorance and denial of existing science? Or is it a genuine um, refusal to accept the data in front of them? I don't understand it. But it is a deepening problem, yes. It is. And we're seeing it in America, looking for it here in Canada, and seeing a little bit of it here in Canada as well. You know, there's a, a debate between how far we go to protect ourselves, and politicians are really having a tough time at what do we close. From a completely scientific point of view, if we're in the second wave, do you think there's any way out of this wave well, without big closure? There's always a way out. There's always a way out. And, um, we're never too far down a road to not be able to turn around and, and reset yourself. The question right now is, do you have another complete lockdown? or not. I don't think we need to right now. I think it's possible to use the assets we have already deployed to greater effect. Let me explain what that that means. So back in March and April, we used the hammer. The hammer is the complete lockdown because we didn't have a scalpel Mm -hmm. to more strategically excise the infection, as it were. But now we have distancing, we have masks, we have a better understanding of where the super spreading events are there in large mass gatherings indoors. So I think it's possible to target target certain sectors for closing, to target certain geographies that are experiencing, you know, particularly uh, high transmission rates, and to enforce better controls within certain businesses and homes, that sort of thing to get this under control. When that fails, then we can consider using the hammer again. But I think we're in a better position now to to have a more administrative and and, um, controlled oversight of of the epidemic. All right, we had the announcement that they have procured from our procurement minister almost 8 million of these rapid COVID tests. How important is this and how could it change the landscape for everyone? Okay, so that's complicated. Um, And it's a good thing. I think we should get as many tools as we can on the table. Um, The controversy is how to use them because these rapid tests have different sensitivities and specificities. They have a different probability of false positives and false negatives. So, for example, I think the new antigen tests have a higher false negative rate than the PCR test. So how do you use that? 
Um, so when we test, there are in general three different strategies for testing. You test for diagnostic purposes. Um, you're sick, you go to the hospital, we test you to see what disease you have so we can treat you. We test for screening purposes, like you know, a mammogram uh, test to see if you may be at risk for breast cancer and you follow up later. And we test for surveillance purposes. That's where we just randomly select a portion of the population, test them, and then never tell them what the results are just to get a sense of where the disease is in the population. These tests, I think, are more amenable to the last, to surveillance testing. They might have a role in screening testing, but definitely for surveillance. And maybe for something we call reassurance testing. That's for people who need a negative test or a positive test to get back to work, for example. We can use that for them. So it ultimately comes down to how strategically we deploy the test, whether or not they will be, quote unquote, game changers. Uh, the technology itself doesn't change much. It's how they're used. But that, you know, is a little bit controversial because these tests and there have been um, there have been reports from those in the medical field and certainly some of the people we've talked to across the country in ICUs that the testing should be prioritized, as you're saying, you know, they want medical officials not to have to be part of the testing and have the labs that get stuck up with these kind of tests for people who just want to move a little bit more freely. Does this rapid test free that up a bit? Again, it does a little bit depending on where you want to use it. Absolutely. But it has to be done delicately because of the false positive and false negative rates depending on the test. So a, a test with a high false positive rate has to be confirmed later on. Like a mammogram, for example, has a high false positive rate. A lot of people get a scary result from the mammogram. They oh my God, I've got breast cancer. They go get a biopsy and discover, oh no, they didn't. It was a false positive. We like that in screening tests because we, we fail to ig ignore possible positive cases walking around. So if there's capacity for a follow-up, it's a great screening test. If there isn't, it's a great surveillance test. So uh, in the meantime, though, uh, building testing capacity for the existing PCR tests is pretty important. It's pretty darn important because we have a lineup of symptomatic people that need to be uh, told whether or not they are infectious, so they have to quarantine. Right? And there's a, a complicated statistical element as well where if you're not testing symptomatic people, you have a higher than average probability of false positives as well. Yeah. I don't want to get too deep into the mathematical woods there, um, but it's uh, testing capacity is everything. In absence of the vaccine, investing everything we have in the ability to test more is our best way to some semblance of normality, whether it's the PCR test, lab capacity, or these rapid tests. It's, it's the right thing to do to get these tests back on the table, yes. I want to ask you, you know, you've been watching this, observing this virus. What are you thinking right now about how this virus is behaving as we look at the second wave, we've had a feeling at the beginning that children were not going to be affected. We've seen otherwise, and now we're seeing a lower death rate. Is that because an Im improvement in medical treatment? What are you thinking about this virus? What are you learning about this virus now? I'm learning more about people than I am about the virus, to be honest. Ah, good answer. To information. And you know, but those of us who are paying attention never expected children to be immune from infection. I mean, we always knew that children were less likely to be infected, less, less likely to show symptoms rather, less likely to die and less likely to transmit it because they've got smaller lungs and are not projecting as much. But when schools are open, we kind of knew there were going to be some cases and some bad effects. So this isn't too surprising for a lot of us who are watching. When it comes to the, um, uh, the lethality rate, the mortality, that is less, I think, of um, something about the virus and more about human behavior. In fact, all of this is about human behavior. So it's less lethal right now because it's infecting a younger demographic who are less likely to be hospitalized, less likely to, to die as a result. But we do not live in a segregated society where the young are sequestered from the old. Teenagers live with their parents, for example, and it's only a matter of time before that younger demographic bleeds over into an older demographic, and it's starting already in Ontario. Um, this past couple of weeks, we've seen that the numbers shift from young to old, which means we're likely to see greater hospitalization rates. I don't think the, the death rates will be as high 
as they were back in March or April for a number of reasons. One is we are better protecting our extremely vulnerable, that is long-term care residents. And we have a little bit more wisdom in how to clinically treat cases. We have more tools like remdesivir, the drug, and dexamethasone. We have a drug that can prevent death and we understand ventilator settings better and things like that. So it won't be as dire in terms of raw death rate, I think. Um, but more people might be infected this time around. Uh, that's what the modeling suggests. It's, uh, it's a wait and see scenario. Dr. Rewat Dionadan, thank you for joining us. Take care. Thanks for your expertise thank you. today.